Thank you for joining us from across the Commonwealth. As Commonwealth journalists, this topic is important to us. We thank the Communist Foundation for prioritizing this issue. And for providing the platform for what we know will be a frank and open exchange of views. The freedom and integrity of our media is critical to upholding democracy. But let us be clear. Across the Commonwealth, assaults on media freedom are becoming increasingly common and severe. Accountability for crimes against journalists for policies and actions that deliberately stifle the free flow of information is giving way to impunity. This is not just a problem for a few countries in a few regions. It is affecting us all, everywhere. This fourth event in the Commonwealth Foundation's Critical Conversation series will look at the real and present threats to media freedom, the safety of those working in the media, what we can learn from Commonwealth countries that are getting it right, and just as importantly, what Commonwealth institutions can do about this. We are asking our speakers to share ideas on how civil society can work against the multiple forces that are seeking to stop the flow of accurate and truthful information. We are asking them to explore what role the Commonwealth could and should play to uphold its own commitment to media freedom. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome and thank you for joining us. And thank you for joining this critical conversation. Well, welcome to this critical conversation on protecting media freedom through the Commonwealth. Uh, a devastating pandemic, viral disinformation and networked hate speech, civil unrest, the resurrection of populist strongmen, teetering democracies, the demonization and targeting of journalists on and offline, and the murder of journalists with impunity for truth telling. As these threats surge and converge, we're living through one of the most volatile and dangerous periods for media freedom and journalism safety in a century. And it is critical that we speak and act to defend these rights across the Commonwealth. I'm Julie Pizzetti, and I'm Global Director of Research at the International Centre for Journalists. I'll be leading you through this conversation today. And although I'm Oxford based here in the UK, as you can hear from my accent, I'm Australian. I'm a citizen of the Commonwealth. And today is Australia Day, which is also known by Australia's Indigenous people as Invasion Day. And while I wish I could tell you that I'm proud of my country's press freedom record, I'm afraid I can't. Australia has no constitutional protections for media freedom. It has an alarming track record of police raids on newsrooms, state-sponsored leak investigations targeting journalists and their confidential sources, the prosecution of journalists for contempt of court and defamation laws that cripple investigative journalism. This helps explain why Australia does not join Jamaica and Canada, Namibia and New Zealand as Commonwealth nations featured in the top 25 ranked countries on the World Press Freedom Index. Close to the bottom of that list, two other Commonwealth countries, Warunda and Singapore, sit alongside states like Syria, Iran and North Korea. Across the Commonwealth, assaults on media freedom and journalism safety are becoming more commonplace and more severe. But only 12 out of the 54 Commonwealth countries have informally endorsed the Commonwealth principles on media freedom and the role of media in good governance. Principle one states that freedom of expression is a cornerstone of democracy and underpins good governance, public accountability and respect for all human rights. Everyone has the right to freedom of expression, it says, which includes the right to seek and receive and impart information of all kinds and through any media, regardless of frontiers. Member states are urged to respect the right to freedom of expression and to promote the free flow of information and ideas. Now, these are noble ideals, but what are the impediments to implementing them? And how can we overcome those obstacles? And what can be done when Commonwealth countries flagrantly breach these principles? 
These are questions central to our discussion today. But before I begin, I want to put this conversation into global context based on some research I'm leading for the International Centre for Journalists in collaboration with UNESCO and the Tao Centre for Digital Journalism at Columbia University. With UNESCO, we've surveyed approximately a thousand journalists in 125 countries to assess the impacts and incidents of online violence against women journalists. 73% of our respondents said they'd been attacked, threatened, abused, or harassed online. Even more alarmingly, 20% said they'd been attacked offline in incidents that they linked to online violence. As part of the Journalism and the Pandemic project with the Tao Centre, we've surveyed 2,000 journalists in 165 countries. 30% of our respondents said their news organisations had sent reporters into the field to cover the pandemic without a single piece of protective equipment, not even a face mask. And 10% reported being publicly attacked by a political leader. We surfaced evidence of a serious mental health crisis among journalists covering COVID-19, along with reports of legal crackdowns such as arrests, detention, prosecutions and internet shutdowns. And I should note, just before we went live today, uh, there is uh, a range of internet shutdowns underway in New Delhi in India. The pandemic presents new threats to journalism safety and media freedom internationally, but it's being used to justify the prosecution of journalists and the tightening of existing restrictions on freedom of expression and access to information. We want to hear from you during this event, so please do post your questions in the Q&A section and you can amplify the conversation by using the hashtag critical conversations and tagging me at Julie Pizzetti as well as at Commonwealth Org. Thanks so much for joining us. Later in the conversation, we'll be joined by international experts to probe the potential responses to the threats I've just outlined. But joining us now to share their lived experience of media freedom and journalism safety challenges on the ground are working journalists from five Commonwealth nations. Multi-award winning Indian investigative journalist Rana Ayub, whose case as a target of online violence is truly emblematic and has led to interventions from multiple UN special rapporteurs, is joined by Carolyn Musket, award winning Maltese investigative journalist and the founder of The Shift, which is an online investigative portal in Malta, which she says publishes in the spirit of murdered Maltese journalist Daphne Caruana Galizia. Shahidul Alam, a multi-award winning Bangladeshi photographer, who is also a renowned pro-democracy activist and digital media pioneer, spent 100 days in jail in 2018 for criticizing the Bangladeshi government. From Ghana, Manesse Azure is one of Ghana's foremost investigative journalist and a staunch anti-corruption crusader. Then we have Claire Rucastle Brown, who is an award winning British journalist and the founder of the Sarawak Report, which challenged wide scale political corruption in Malaysia and its impacts on the environment as well as civil and indigenous rights. In 2015, Malaysia actually issued a warrant for her arrest and asked Interpol to place her on the international red notice list. So we have um, the honor of being joined by these five exceptional Commonwealth journalists. Thank you very much, all of you for being with us. Um, Rana, I want to start with you, please. Um, from India, what is the most serious threat you are currently facing as an investigative reporter, an independent investigative reporter, in fact? Uh, thank you, Julie. Um, uh, it's, it's a bit embarrassing that I'm only going to be joining for a few minutes because I've just, uh, I've, I've just undergone a, a severe spine surgery, so I'm not allowed to sit for more than 10 minutes. So I'll, uh, it's a crucial day and Julie, when you, uh, when you spoke about um, 26th of January being an important day for Australia in India, we are celebrating uh, our Republic Day, which celebrates the Indian constitution. Um, and then on a day like today, Indian media is comparing uh, the siege of Capitol Hill to what farmers in India are doing to protest against the Indian government. And that is such a blatant lie. And that's what uh, that's what ails Indian journalism today. That most of Indian journalists have become statists. They are actually they have actually become propagandists. 
which is the reason why journalists like me are compelled to be independent journalists who are not affiliated with any news organizations. Uh, like you pointed out in your introduction, there are just as many defamation cases against me, uh, especially since I went undercover in 2010 um, to, to, uh, to, uh, to basically highlight the role of the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, uh, in, in, and his role in the genocide of Muslims and that his majoritarian rule continues to be what it was uh, over, over the last 18 years. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a struggle to report in Modi's India. I mean, it's not that I have seen not seen tough times before as a journalist, but reporting in Modi's India comes with, of course, you know, me, the assumption that I being a woman a Muslim woman, somebody who is a critic of Narendra Modi. So I basically take all the boxes to be condemned, to be trolled. And of course, um, it's not just online trolling. The trolling also becomes offline when burned copies of my book are sent to my residence, when uh, when my image is moved on a porn video and, and sent all over the country and is, is, is shared on all of um, almost every phone and WhatsApp and social media in India, I get death threats on a daily basis. And why do I do? Why do I get that? Because I choose not to filter my truth. Unfortunately, in the world that we live in today, especially in, um, especially during the pandemic, where the Indian government used the pandemic as an excuse to target dissenters and silence activists. Um, Voices like mine are being silent and there are many unsung voices in India. I'm not the only one. I happen to be somebody who's a public voice who has a, who has social media following, but there are many journalists like me, especially women journalists who are targeted day in, day out for their role in highlighting the majoritarianism and the fundamentalism of the Narendra Modi government. Journalism has never been more important than it is today for uh, for especially for democracies that who would have thought the irony that today our democracies are uh, there's so much at stake at democracies especially in a country like india which calls itself the world's largest largest democracy where our very fundamental and constitutional values are at stake and where our journalists believe in towing the line of the state as opposed to uh, exposing them um, so there are very few voices who are, in a way, launching a backlash against the backlash, and those who are, are being subjected to the most virulent attacks on social media. When I say social media, I do not want anyone to assume that these are only trolls who basically come online and, you know, abuse you and leave. No. My colleague Gauri Lankesh was murdered in 2017. Uh, within a month of publishing my book in a regional language and a day before she was assassinated she was killed I, I remember her calling me and saying you know rana don't get upset by these trolls these are just paper tigers they can't do anything to you they're just income poops and the next day she was murdered right outside her house this so is one of the most uh chilling realities isn't it rana that this online violence the surge in which we're we, tracking. i think we dismiss i think i remember each time i go to a police station to file a complaint and they say ma'am it's only online what they do not realize is that there's a very thin line between online and offline in the times that we live in today people have access to your addresses people dox you on social media they have access to your address they have access to your phone numbers there is an entire dossier which was revealed to me by somebody in the intelligence agency um, there is a 41 page dossier on my family on where my father goes for his morning walk, but what school my nieces go to, where does my where does my 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 sister go for her shopping. So everything is known by this dispensation and that knowledge is being given to these foot soldiers who are doing this ruthless job of silencing journalists. I am joined on this panel by Caroline Muscat, who will talk about what happened to Daphne, what happened to Shahidul Alam. We all know what's this is some of the bravest voices. Uh, in the world are being silenced. And the only thing that they ha we have right now is we have each other, which is why I have chosen to come here and speak only for five minutes is because I want to show solidarity with these brave voices because these are the need of the hour today as we stand. And I think that's extraordinary testament to your bravery, Rana, and the fact that we do need uh, to stand together um, on these issues. And um, I just, before I let you go, and again, thank you for, for making this real personal sacrifice today to be with us despite your ill health. Um, 
is there something that you would like to say to, com to the Commonwealth as an institution, uh, to Commonwealth states um, and to civil society organisations that work with uh, the Commonwealth, um, specifically about your own situation? What is the one thing that could be done to shift things where you are in India, do you think? I think not just about India, I think if we need to protect democracies around the world, you need to protect the journalists and you need to protect these people who are giving you information that is unfiltered. It is the, not just the jo job of Commonwealth, of course, they have increased responsibility. Uh, never in the history of the world has it been more important to protect the power of the pen, to protect those who are speaking the truth unfiltered. Um, I think it will be extremely important and crucial for the Commonwealth to now uh, understand that this is not just a global problem it's also a local problem it's going to affect us each and every day uh it is time they intervene it is time they speak in words that are heard by the world in ways that should be heard we have to be loud enough to be heard uh i don't think there are enough voices and we really trust the commonwealth to speak up right now um uh, for each one of us and thank you for organizing this platform for us Thanks so much, Rana. Please do go and rest now. And, Thank, you. Um, Thank you. Thanks again for, for, for taking the time uh, in very difficult circumstances to join this important discussion. Take care. Caroline Musket, I'm going to come to you uh, next. As uh, Rana Ayub said, um, you're based in Malta. You're a former uh, colleague and compatriot of uh, the murdered investigative journalist Daphne Caruana Galizia, who herself uh, faced um, brutal online violence campaigns, uh, which certainly spilled offline in the form of uh, attacks on her family, her home, her pets, and so on. Um, can you talk to us about the situation there now? And I know you've also been a target in, in, in a similar way to Daphne and that which um, uh, Rana was outlining about her own experience. Um, but is, is online violence the worst of it or is it just a symptom uh, of something deeper uh, that's, that's um, affecting independent journalism and press freedom in Malta? And if it is, how would you describe that threat? Um, yes, I think experience has now shown us, uh, especially in Malta, that that online violence translates into physical violence. Daphne Caruana Galizia uh, was killed uh, on 16th October 2017 by a car bomb uh, a few meters outside her home. She was uh, investigating uh, corruption in the country. And that is clearly the reason um, why why she was killed. Um, after after her 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 death, uh, which was a shock in Malta and 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 for our audience who perhaps uh, don't know, don't don't know where Malta is, Malta is a small island in the middle of the Mediterranean, but it's uh, also a European Union member state. So the assassination of a journalist uh, it was was shocking, and and that changed that changed a number of things. Um, first of all, the, the 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 news website that 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 I founded after her assassination, which was a message intended to to be sent back to the perpetrators to say you can't kill one of us, you can't silence our voices. So we felt that that change was important. Uh, it also led to a a very strong civil society movement that that managed to to bring down. Um, those in power, people who everybody thought were untouchable. So, um, but but um, with there was a combination of um, investigations by journalists, civil society movements uh, taking that up, and protesting on the streets, which which led to to certain changes. We are we are far, very very far, from from justice being done. Um, and that is because of the context which enabled Daphne's assassination. So, so um, one of the first things that we did um, as 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 um, fledgling news portal was was to conduct an investigation. Um, and 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 this is information I shared um, with with Rana when we met at the International Journalism Festival, I think a couple of years ago, because we couldn't we couldn't meet last year. Um, was was an investigation into into um, online groups. We wanted to understand um, online political discourse. 
how this may or may not have contributed to, to the assassination of Daphne Caruana Galizia. And what we found was, was quite astonishing. So we started the investigation in 2017. Um, uh, we focused mostly on Facebook because, because in Malta, um, Facebook is dominant. Um, the rest of the social media um, less, are less popular. So, so that is where we focused our attention. Um, and and with with the help of um, three researchers and we we and the help of whistleblowers, we managed to to infiltrate political groups online. That uh, and we we discovered uh, six online online Facebook groups managed that that managed and co-administered by 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 the political party in government. They were they were started before the party was in government, but as these as 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 they gained power, um, the, the co-administrators on, on 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 these on these on these groups were were people who worked at ministries um, and 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 the members of the groups were were, were, were you know members of uh, members of parliament, the prime minister, um, or a number of ministers. So so it was it was quite shocking to discover how narratives were built. Um, and and the impact that that they had, and we are talking about groups that these six groups reached sixty thousand members, which in a country like Malta is half a million people, mm. is, is very 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 significant. Um, and and some of the stuff that some of the the findings um, from this investigation is first of all the extremely hyper partisan language, um, including hate speech, very clear hate speech. Um, the, the, the manufacturing and the spread of toxic narratives. So Daphne Caruana Galizia became the witch. Mm. Uh, and, and, you Very know, general as well, isn't it? I mean, this is a big part of the uh, profile of, uh, of attacks being made. Sexism, misogyny uh, are weaponized along with disinformation. Yeah. And, and, and in Malta, this is particularly pronounced. There, it's, a, it, it's a very misogynistic society. Um, and 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 that infiltrates all 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 of this effort. Um, I'm going to uh, have to move on now, Caroline. But we'll come back to some of these themes. Um, Shahidul Alam, you describe your life's work as a as part of a struggle for democracy, um, and your book, My Journey as a Witness, has been described as the most important book ever written by a photographer. So I'm keen to hear you uh, bear witness for us today about the situation on the ground in Bangladesh. What do you think is the most pressing issue facing journalists there today? Well, firstly, thank you for organizing this. Uh, I should point out, while this is a very precarious situation for journalists and Bangladesh is in general uh, at the moment, it's, it's not new. I mean, we've really not had democracy uh, for a very, very long time. Um, I mean, there was military rule for a stage and then at that time you didn't expect it. But then we had elections, we expected electorally, you know, democratically elected governments to behave differently. Sadly, they haven't. Um, in my case, I've had uh, a loaded gun pointed at my face when the military dictator was there. I had, I received eight knife wounds in the subsequently uh, elected government and this government uh, put me behind for 107 days and I was uh, tortured and you know, taken away in a ridiculous situation. So uh, that's the general situation. It's particularly, I mean, I, I'll, I resonate a little bit with what Rana said because one of my concerns today is that the media, with important exceptions, is no longer playing its role what is also important is the fact that voices that you would, at a time like this, expect to be speaking out, uh, voices which have spoken out in the past against particular regimes today, are completely silent. I mean, a certain amount of it, I'm sure, has to do with fear, but it, I'm sure it also has to do with people wanting to pick up the crumbs by being closer to the seat of power. Uh, mm. And that is, that is a concern uh, we all have. In my particular case, um, I was reporting on student protests. I was roughed up, my equipment smashed the following day. I was uploading pictures and in a commando style raid, they uh, came into our flat and I was blindfolded, handcuffed, taken away, tortured. 
And the following day, when in court, I actually mentioned that I'd been tortured, as is expected in a court, that there would be investigation of that sort. Nothing of that sort took place. Uh, so I was put in remand, which is a Bangladeshi euphemism for torture. Uh, and after a week there, sent to jail, I was refused bail five times. And on the sixth attempt, I was given bail. Interestingly, the judge on the bail verdict said that the prosecution had failed to provide a shred of evidence for any of the accusations made against me on the first information report. Uh, but the fact remains, I am on bail and I, if convicted, face 14 years in prison. Now, uh, beyond that, there is the immediate effect uh, of what happens. I mean, I, I have my family around me, I have my colleagues, I have my students, and what happens to me affects them as well. So I have to look out for them. So there are differences in day-to-day -day habits. I, I used to go around on a bicycle. That's the way I reported. I'd stop in the streets, talk to people. It's no longer safe for me to be on the streets in that manner. Uh, I don't carry a mobile phone because I know I'm going to be tracked and um, surveillance is uh, so pervasive. But uh, while I have these things to say about uh, the government, and all governments have done this, I also have a question to the Commonwealth leaders because I think there is a culpability there. I, I think when we have a regime such as this doing what it does, for them to stay, for them to stay silent is also a slap on our face. And when they, in an attempt to cozy up to, uh, well, basically a regime that they consider pliant. And this is also our observation. I mean, regardless of the rhetoric, these are governments that find uh, a pliant dictator far easier to deal, do business with than a messy democracy. And these are the governments that provide the equipment, provide the training, that does the surveillance on people like yeah. us. Uh, and I think that culpability is not something they can escape. Yeah, two very important words there, culpability and accountability. And that's going to be the substance of the latter part of our conversation today. Thank you so much, Shahidul. We'll come back to you, um, to Ghana now, and Manessa Azure. Um, you're often held up as a leader in African, uh, Ghana rather, is often held up as a leader in African media freedom, but it has slipped back three places on the World Press Freedom Index uh, in this past year. Journalists are increasingly uh, physically attacked, uh, particularly in reference to anti-corruption investigations, for example. What's the biggest um, threat or challenge that, that you confront um, and, and the colleagues that you work closely with as you try to hold power to account in Ghana? And you're going to need to turn your mute off. Thanks. I think the biggest threat is something I wouldn't speak about five years ago. In the past, when I attended international conferences and I spoke about media freedom in Ghana, after the conference, my colleague journalists would move towards me and tell me how blessed I was to be practicing in Ghana. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to say that today because in the past four years, specifically from 2017 till date, when there was a change in government, we saw our fortunes beginning to deteriorate and quite a number of factors have accounted for that. Here in Ghana, as in a lot of the developing countries, we have too much power concentrated on the executives and state institutions are not working. And so when a political party is in government, uh, members of that political party become almost untouchable. So whatever they do, nobody gets punished. And so the impunity is actually finding these uh, attacks. A number of issues uh, account for what we are experiencing in this country, the sense of insecurity, uh, a number of radio stations were shut down and the reason was that they did not meet regulatory requirements but it was also obvious that some of those that were targeted were those that were perceived to be anti-government we also had a situation in 2019 when some journalists of an online portal modernkana.com were actually raided the media house was raided 
and the two of the reporters were picked, including the editor. They were blindfolded and taken to the national security uh, premises, detained. One of them actually said he was tortured. I personally made calls to one of the national security ministers, and he told me that, well, there was evidence against wrongdoing, and so they would make it known. Eventually, there was no such evidence. They just went to court and uh, later withdrew the case, and nothing happened to the minister. We also know that in 2019, also a journalist working with my colleague Anas Arimi Anas, they did some work on football corruption in Ghana and a member of parliament in the governing party actually put a photograph of the undercover investigative journalist on live television, national television, and ordered viewers, told them where this person lived and ordered viewers to attack him and that he would pay whatever consequences that, were, that would arise. Not long after that, two persons on a motorbike actually went to that vicinity, shot and killed this journalist. As we speak, nothing has happened to this politician. I would want to think that there may not be laws to handle such actions, but interestingly, people who threaten others belonging to the governing party have been arrested and are prosecuted. I can talk about uh, three of them recently, I think a week or two, one music producer who made threatening comments against the president was arrested. There was a so-called pastor who also made threatening comments against the president an electoral commission chairperson. He's also been prosecuted. And a journalist made some comments on radio that were deemed threatening. He's also been arrested and is being prosecuted. And so when you put this against somebody who openly threatened a journalist, that journalist was killed and nothing has been done. Mm. And it gives a lot of incentive for wrongdoing on the part of those who would want to attack journalists. Indeed, and it's quite a contrast, isn't it, of unaccountability uh, and impunity uh, and the weaponization of the law against those who seek to try to ensure accountability in governance. Um, a disturbing picture you're, you're painting there of backsliding, if you like, uh, within countries where media freedom has perhaps been uh, pursued um, with, with more commitment than other countries. So this is another thing that we need to be uh, focused on, I think, in, in responding to this problem. Um, we'll come back to you later, Manasseh, but to Claire Rucastle brown now. Um, you're a, a British journalist, but you were born in uh, Sarawak and um, you started as I mentioned before, uh, a website called Sarawak Reports Claire, um, having faced uh, a range of charges um, that were dropped uh, in 2018 after the, um, the election of a new government in Malaysia. And of course you were never actually added to that red notice list, but you don't work uh, in Malaysia and not as frequently as you would like because it's not safe to do so. So can you bring us up to date on what the situation is like uh, in Malaysia, and from your perspective, what the greatest risks are facing journalists there? Well, um, Malaysia has just had a, 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 a total sort of backslide, really, um, following um, the uh, reporting that I was doing uh, prior to, 19, uh, to, to 2018. Um, there was a very oppressive media environment. Um, and um, listening to my colleagues who are living and working in dangerous societies, you know, um, uh, my admiration for them is unbounded. Um, and there was a similar um, oppressive media environment in Malaysia, um, not in terms so much of, of people actually losing their lives, but in terms of um, very, very rigorous enforcement of extremely vague, comprehensive laws um, that could put journalists into prison, uh, really for annoying the authorities. And so I adopted a method of uh, writing from the UK um, as a sort of protection. That was actually the use of the internet that I was able to employ. Um, and um, acting as an independent journalist, I guess I 
demonstrated through my experiences the valuable public interest role that we play. Um, I took on a, a, an incredibly sensitive um, issue at the heart of power in, in Malaysia. I, I exposed the Prime Minister for his involvement in a multi-billion dollar theft. Um, and those charges that were issued against me from Malaysia, which they tried to implement in the UK, were um, for spreading false news and attacking democracy. Um, and um, it was really only because I was able to continue uh, to pursue my investigations. I'm sure if I had been writing in Malaysia, I would have long since been behind bars, silenced, and uh, Najib Razak, instead of being convicted, would still be prime minister. That's the role of independent journalism. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, as I say, I, I wasn't, uh, in, in, you know, um, immune from uh, lashback. And I can talk perhaps later about the problems that we, um, we, we have um, with, with the British involvement in, in pushing back on journalists. There's a, there's a, a, a profession, really, of um, uh, involving many British companies who are making lives very difficult for journalists across the Commonwealth and the world. Um, but um, getting back to Malaysia's situation today, we, we saw as a result, partly of my exposures, um, a change of government, the first change of government effectively in Malaysia since independence in 2018. There has been pushback on that, um, that that government was overthrown. Uh, by a, a counter coup effectively, a political coup um, at the start of last year. Um, and we have seen the reintroduction of, uh, you know, a very impressive media environment according to the majority of journalists that I'm in touch with. Um, and uh, you now have a situation where um, as that uh, government in Malaysia has lost its majority in parliament, it has um, used uh, the excuse of COVID to uh, simultaneously, on the day it lost its majority, to issue a state of emergency, supposedly to tackle COVID. And journalists have told me that um, you know, it's been made perfectly clear to them that um, it, really any criticism will be seen as a criticism of the declaration of the state of emergency and thereby um, of the king who uh, agreed to it. Um, and um, if you criticize the king in Malaysia, you're in very deep trouble. There are all sorts of rules that can be brought, laws that can be used against you. Um, and uh, there are several examples of Malaysian journalists, Malaysian citizens, Malaysian activists, uh, particularly egregiously some Malaysian students who wrote a paper about their concerns about the, uh, the monarch overstepping his role. Mm. Um, they have now been charged with sedition. So that's the situation in Malaysia. Yeah, which is, um, you know, a, um, a really troubling picture. And please do let's come back to the uh, enabling role played by some more progressive uh, states in the Commonwealth and in, in uh, the UK, for example. But two points you um, highlighted there, I think, um, bear underlining. And one is uh, to point out that while um, the internet and, and the tools of freedom of expression that we once thought of as social media have been weaponized, um, you know, they, they do enable viral disinformation, which has become deadly and has caused the destabilization of democracies uh, around the world. But at the same time, we're seeing states uh, weaponize the law in response to um, the, the, the rise of disinformation as a serious challenge to justify crackdowns under so-called fake news laws, for example, uh, against journalists and other civil society uh, organizations doing journalistic type work. Um, in fact, that's the subject uh, of um, a book that UNESCO commissioned that I um, worked on with a range of colleagues looking at how we actually deal with the problem of disinformation while respecting freedom of expression and in particular press freedom. So this is a, a huge challenge, I think, particularly as you've outlined uh, in states like Malaysia. Um, we've actually got some audience questions and uh, one of them is for you, Claire. So I'm going to uh, bring that to you now. Um, so we have one from uh, Shin Hai Mel, I'm sorry if I'm uh, mispronouncing your name, uh, who asks, Claire, what's your perspective on the fraternity of media in Malaysia and what practical advice can you give uh, to local journalists who are reporting on corruption, which is um, extremely challenging, but, but what kind of advice could you offer? It's a very difficult one. Um, you know, right now, um, every criticism, particularly if it's high level corruption, 
um, the, of the government is then uh, reinterpreted as an insult against an, an, an institution that cannot be criticized. Um, and um, they have a specific uh, modus operandi. You'll get a politically motivated police report put in um, and the police then only too eagerly and servilely turn up at uh, whoever's door it is um, and arrest them and start charging them under you know, a, a whole um, panoply of uh, very flexible laws that um, have been brought into um, into use in Malaysia. Um, so it, it's it's a, it's a tightrope for journalists. And and what I'm hearing increasingly is that phone calls are being made from uh, the heart of government to newsrooms, uh, saying, "Watch it, you know, don't don't." Um, don't uh, demean our efforts. You're, you know, that's working against the national interest, and you don't want to do that, do you? One of the one of the um, one of the things that's been happening more again is people reach out to me. They say, "I can't publish this. Can you?" Mm -hmm. Um, so we do have to, to utilize um, our network, our global network, um, all of us journalists, there are a lot of us and we have a lot of people who follow us um, and care about what we care about. Um, and so we are a voice. That's also a really important uh, development, I think, in journalism's collective response to these challenges, and that is the outsourcing of uh, risk of publication, say, for example, to ensure greater legal protection by publishing in one country versus another. So these are all useful trends uh, to observe. Thanks very much for that, Claire. Um, and we have another question, which I think I'll put to Caroline, given your role uh, as an editor and a, a website founder, Caroline. Um, Paul Bryan asks, um, with citizens increasingly turning to um, non-mainstream media alternative publications, which often lack journalistic standards and accountability um, practice within traditional media organizations. Um, how can these organizations be held accountable by citizens? And I guess that gets to the uh, conundrum that in some countries you have what might be termed traditional journalism being complicit, you know, being partisan uh, and in the pockets of governments, which is something you know, we have to acknowledge as a problem. Uh, but in alternatively, um, we see organizations springing up, filling the voids and gaps um, that, you know, where there are such journalistic failures. And um, this is important, you know, uh, and in fact, your own organization, um, although you certainly come from a traditional journalistic background, is not what we would call a, you know, a, a traditional mainstream publication. So how do you respond to that question? You know, is there a need for accountability mechanisms um, around journalism startups, particularly if they're not from, uh, the, you know, the, the founders are not from a journalistic background? Um, I think I think we tend to put too much uh, into one bag when we talk about alternative. Um, we, yeah. although although our platform is alternative, so to speak, we all come from a journalistic background. We all have experience working in newsrooms and covering international stories. So and and we are we are held um, to we are held accountable in the same way any other traditional media is. Um, we have to abide by the same laws. We face the same court cases. Etc. Uh, in terms of, I mean, yes, of course, there is another, there is another level, and and where where these platforms are set up, without necessarily having the the journalistic uh, training or experience, um, yet these two have to abide by the same rules and regulations. They will be held um, to the same standards, and I think as as a as the journalistic community, I think it is in our interest. To, and, and this is what we do um, with our platform, we share our skills, our training as much as possible with people who are trying to, to hold government to, their, to account in their own way by showing them, by teaching them how, how to fact check, how, how, how to filter information, how to assess sources, how to protect sources and all of these things. So it's about mm -hmm. the sharing of information rather than saying this is yes and this is no. And a degree of professionalism, um, which is important to that. Thanks very much. So look, I think we're going to move on now to the part of our conversation focused on uh, what lessons have been learned to date uh, by countries uh, within the Commonwealth uh, and intergovernmental organisations um, supporting the development of, of media freedom uh, internationally. And the threats we've discussed so far really are contributing to an erosion of democratic culture and uh, diminished accountability of governments at a time when this sort of accountability has never been more urgent or more important. Um, and as I just alluded to, there are risks associated with this 
uh, in some countries um, where political agendas, political influences is brought to bear uh, and where uh, news organisations um, which are not necessarily independent um, can be implicated uh, in these acts. So what can be done by and with Commonwealth institutions and how can civil society work against all of these um, forces that are seeking to uh, inhibit the free flow of accurate information? Um, and what's the role of the Commonwealth in this? How can it remain true to these principles? These are the, the, the questions I want to get into now. Um, so we're going to bring three um, international experts uh, into the discussion. Uh, the first is Zoe Titus, who's director of the Namibia Media Trust. Uh, the second is Jamaican journalist and academic Stefan Campbell. And he leads uh, uh, academic research and also um, journalistic investigations that are associated with the Caribbean Investigative Journalism Network. And Guy Berger, who leads uh, UNESCO's work on the United Nations Plan of Action on the Safety of Journalists and the Issue of Impunity, who's also overseen much of UNESCO's work on disinformation and in fact commissioned that book that I mentioned earlier. And Guy, um, I might uh, cue you to share that book if you haven't already done that um, in the chat, which I, I'm just too much multitasking for me today. I'm not managing to get to the chat. Um, but let's start with you, uh, Zoe. Um, Namibia is going to host uh, the UN's World Press Freedom Day celebration in May, just 30 years after the Windhoek Declaration that gave birth to that day. Um, and, and you are now, Namibia, rather than you, Zoe, uh, the top ranked African country uh, on the World Press Freedom Index. It's maintained by Reporters Without Borders. And I know you're very committed particularly to access to information um, as, as the bedrock for, for all other rights. So can I get you to reflect on that uh, for a moment and the progress that you have helped bring about uh, within Namibia um, in terms of what other Commonwealth uh, nations and uh, Commonwealth civil society organisations might learn uh, from your experiences. And you're muted, I think, Zoe. Can't hear you. Oh, try again. I think maybe unplug your headphones, Zoe. It could be a, an issue with your, your headphones. How was that? That's better. We can hear you. Excellent. It was bound to happen. <laughs> so I'll just have to increase my volume because I can't hear you very well now. Um, thanks, Judy. Um, in Namibia, um, indeed, they, we have an illustrious history uh, in the media freedom and, and free expression arena, um, as you've mentioned, at the birthplace of the Vindic Declaration. Um, and which was the catalyst for similar declarations the world over, uh, we are now, as you've also mentioned, in the process of preparing for the celebration of the 30th anniversary of the Vintage Declaration. Um, to answer your question, um, the starting point for a lot of the campaigning that we have done around media freedom and freedom of expression is supported by the fact that the right of freedom of expression is enshrined in the Namibian constitution. In fact, um, Article 21, um, Chapter 3 of the Constitution states that all persons um, shall have the right to freedom of expression, uh, freedom of speech and expression, which includes freedom of the press and other media. So uh, already there is a legal framework supporting the campaigning work um, of civil society. Um, one of the reasons I do believe um, that there have been some successes, um, I think, in Namibia and, and Africa as a whole. Civil society organizations have registered a number of policy advocacy successes and, and, and things that really should be documented a lot better. But that's because there is commitment on the part of the Namibian government, I believe, to, to living up to the legacy of the Vintage Declaration. Yes. Um, and maintaining this cordial relationship with the media. But um, you know, some friction um, between government and media is healthy. So, so tensions do rear 
their heads on occasion. So briefly, um, our experience um, of how um, or those critical ingredients that, that are required um, to advance media freedom and freedom of expression, um, I would say there are three main issues. Uh, that would be government commitment to media freedom and freedom of expression. Um, that's essential and I uh, believe that that is present in Namibia. Um, to complement that, um, a strong, um, and I've emphasized a strong capacitated civil society that is consistent and principled in monitoring and advocating for, for press freedom. And then at the same time, uh, citizens would truly and, and jealously guard their right to freedom of expression. Um, Namibia tells a very good story, Julie, but I think it's, it's always important to put things in, in, into context. Mm. It is a relatively young nation, um, attained independence in 1990, so um, about 30 years old. Um, and that ended a long history of colonial oppression. So in this context, the double whammy of colonialism and apartheid means that many, many structural inequalities persist in a, a post-independent Namibia. And it's for this reason, largely, I, I believe that both government and citizens are deeply committed to promoting development, peace and security. And I think here yeah, in this uh, context, I'm, I'm speaking to the converted when I point out the, um, the centrality of a free independent press uh, for economic development and sustainability. But yet again, like all other countries, Namibia is experiencing its challenges in, in um, this context. Um, such challenges would include the adoption of laws and policies by the state and private sector actors that um, I think unjustifiably restrict the right to freedom of expression. This is typically done under the guise of, um, for example, national security. Mm, which and is a very, very common theme internationally. Which is far beyond, I mean, what is permitted under the law. Um, just to mention a few, our Protection of Information Act 84 of 1982, that's a apartheid era law. The Communications Act two of, uh, two, uh, 2009, which makes provision for interception of communications. Um, and then um, the Prevention uh, and Combating of Terrorist and Proliferation Activities Act of 2014. Just to, to, to name a few. Sure. On the other hand, um, you find that the lack of a legal framework that guarantees the right to access information remains an impediment for citizens. So it is this balancing act that mm. we are trying to, to maintain. Uh, in Namibia, um, the Namibia Media Trust is the secretariat of the Action Namibia Coalition, which is campaigning for that access to information or that legal framework that guarantees the right to access to information. Um, we took our uh, lead from the African platform on access to information, a continental lobbying network um, that has given us the African platform on access to information, a PI declaration. So yeah, many um, best practice examples that we um, as Namibian citizens can, can um, uh, refer to, to, to advance our own campaign work. So, okay, now, Zoe, I'm going to, I'm just going to pause you there because people are having a bit of a hard time hearing you. Um, so well, we'll come back to you eventually, but if you could also move closer to the microphone on the computer, um, that would be helpful given the issues we have with your headphones, but some very important points made there about solidarity and advocacy and collaboration. Uh, in Namibia's case. So, um, Stefan Campbell, I'm going to come to you now. Um, Jamaica is ranked sixth on the World Press Freedom Index, just behind uh, a host of Scandinavian countries and the Netherlands. Um, what can Jamaica's gains, do you think, teach other Commonwealth nations about how to go about defending media freedom and embedding uh, the sorts of principles that um, we're advocating for here? Thank you, Julie. 
uh, first things first, let me just say that um, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago originally, but I've been based in Jamaica for the past 14 years and work with the, the CIG, and which is the Caribbean Investigative Journalism Network. And I say that to say that I have been able to draw and compare and contrast the, the strengths of Jamaica, especially with some of the issues in Trinidad and Tobago and so on and so forth. And what I will say, the Jamaican journalistic landscape as it relates to some of the laws that have been that, that have been adjusted, that have been put in place. When, when Kant speaks about freedom from, has removed some of the barriers for journalists that, that were in the way of journalists so, to practice, right? In terms of um, the, the changes in, in, the, in the Defamation Act that, ensure, that, that, that sort of reduces the time that someone can bring libel charges against a, a journalist, for example. You know, the Access to Information Act since 2002 that made it a little bit easier for the journalists to access certain types of information. It's not perfect because even some of the exempt documents are, are, are vague so that it, it's, it's easy for, 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 for certain documents to be refused. But I think the, the, the platform and the foundation is there. And I think the landscape, the Jamaican landscape is still, or, or Jamaica is still very, very receptive or still very much respect the journalists as an academic as well. It is still, it, the, 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 the journalism program is still one of the, the, the most highly requested. So there is that, I, I, I was listening to Manasseh and his experiences. And it is very important for us to strike that balance between the legal framework and the legal landscape that allows for the journalists to practice freely. Jamaica has also, you know, for, 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 far, for, for a very long time, reduced government control of the, of the media organizations, but that's one side. I also feel like in addition to the respect that journalists get, and fortunate, fortunately there have been no recent attacks on, on, on journalists like, 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 like the other countries. But it is very important for us to understand that the concept of media literacy and the publics that we seek to serve is equally as important to get them to continually understand the role and the value of, of media and the press in this day and age. You know, for the past four years, we, we, we know about the United States and the things that have happened, right? And it's very easy Although Jamaica enjoys a very prominent space on the index, at any point in time, all it takes, again, like Manasseh says, all it takes is for a particular type of government and a particular type of narrative to come into play. And you add that to any misunderstandings or, 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 or of what media should be doing and what the press should be doing. And there just might be a shift. So I think, I mean, and even yesterday, you, I, I must acknowledge the Press Association of Jamaica for, because even yesterday there was a panel discussion on, the, on, on, on whether Jamaica deserves its standing on, on the Press Freedom Index. Mm -hmm. and, 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 I, and I believe it does, because again, listening to the experiences of other journalists, it is, it, the, the, the climate is not as hostile, but it needs to be preserved. We need to also understand that Jamaica is a very small island, which is also why the collaboration between the other countries, the other territories in the Caribbean and in the Commonwealth is even more important so that we can learn from each other, right? Um, there are a lot of lessons to learn from Jamaica, but we also learn from dialogues and discussions like Some these. Really, really important points there, um, Stefan. You've, you've, you've raised the, uh, the value of collaboration uh, and networking from a, an on the ground perspective, but also the need for constant vigilance. And yes. as you have eloquently pointed out, I think that the US uh, and other um, international developments in liberal democracies around the world have shown us that we're only ever really one election and one social networking weaponization <laughs> route away from uh, a real deterioration, even where um, you know, institutions have been held up as world leading, for example, in mm -hmm. the case of the US where journalists were of course uh, referred to by 
the former president of the United States as enemies of the people, um, ah. which, which led to a whole range of uh, attacks. So yes, I think those are, those are super uh, points to make. Um, Guy Berger, we'll, we'll come to you now. Um, you were an editor in South Africa in the aftermath of apartheid and an academic with a long track record on media freedom research uh, before joining UNESCO, where you've spent, I think, something like a decade uh, helping the UN to manage um, many of the critical issues that we have uh, discussed today. Can I ask you to draw on your collective experience? Because I think it's important to hear not just from uh, a person in, in a senior position within the UN, but a person who also has these experiences uh, and this background. Um, so perhaps if you could um, emphasize the role of legislative, um, legal and judicial reform, for example, um, in securing uh, media freedom rights um, and any other experiences you'd like to share. Sure, uh, thank you, Julie, and thanks also to the Commonwealth Foundation uh, you know, I'm from South Africa and the Commonwealth had made a difference to South Africa and apartheid because in 1991, the Commonwealth had the Harare Declaration uh, that really pushed uh, the momentum in South Africa towards a democratic and non-racial country. And three years later, the first democratic elections took place. And today you have strong press freedom in South Africa. And so this is an experience that uh, I do uh, take to heart and I see the potential role for the Commonwealth in this, as well as other international organizations. Uh, I'd also just signal that the same year as the Harari Declaration, 1991, you had the Vintuk Declaration, uh, which was of course with uh, Namibia and Zoe Titus mentioned that uh, we're coming up to the 30th anniversary of this Vintuk Declaration because it gave rise, thanks to UNESCO, who's now my employer, the Vintuk Declaration gave rise to World Press Freedom Day on the 3rd of May. So watch that space. And the 3rd of May is a big deal because it's a time for everybody to really underline what's happening and what should happen in terms of, of press freedom. I also just wanted to say from an international organization point of view, um, we're coming up next year of the, of the UN plan of action on the safety of journalists. Uh, it's a big framework led by UNESCO, and there's a lot of things going on in, under this UN plan of action. Many governments are finally uh, persuaded to set up mechanisms to protect journalists or investigate attacks against them. They're joining alliances. I'll mention some shortly. And I'll tell you also later this week, the Pan-African um, uh, groups are setting up in conjunction with the UNESCO and the African Union, a platform to monitor safety of journalists, a bit like the Council of Europe is doing. And in a way, the Commonwealth could be lagging behind uh, some of these international roles as regards safety of journalists. But um, I'm glad to say that indeed the Commonwealth Foundation has been involved in talking with other international organizations about joining a task force of these international organizations to share safety of journalists, share information about it. Now, I just wanna make one quick point, Julie, that I think while each individual case is important to address, the underlying context is fundamental. And here, I think international organizations play a role because they really make visible declarations and norms and statements. And these can affect how political actors and indeed the public treat journalists. And I think we have an opportunity now to underline everybody that a press freedom norm is vital because it recognizes the value of the media that's calling out disinformation, including disinformation that's being amplified for profit by internet companies, even when these companies say they've been taking it down or treating it in some other ways. And the value of press freedom is also a norm that we can underline now because independent media can monitor procurement of safety equipment, the rollout of vaccines. It's through press freedom that and the media that we can learn about the mistakes and solutions that are taking place elsewhere. We can adapt these experiences at this critical time. Now, how can we take advantage of, I think what's becoming evident to everybody that press freedom is, is key for tackling this pandemic. Well, I, I come back to this question of international alliances. 
And so I would just point out to you that um, there are two fairly recent developments internationally. One is called the Media Freedom Coalition and one is called the Hague Commitments. Now, I think five or six or seven countries in the Commonwealth are members of the one and members of the other. These are big uh, commitments, say by, by I don't know, 30, 40 countries. There's no reason why your countries and Commonwealth countries couldn't be members of, of these two commitments, which creates a statement about where they stand in terms of press freedom. So if your country is not signed up to these, you could ask them if they want to sign up or you could dialogue about the Commonwealth principles and the role of the media, which have been adopted in 2018, as Julie said. Uh, or you can use the upcoming Kigali Summit to start a dialogue with your governments about this global momentum that's taking place, these global alliances, and why these principles are important for the Kigali meeting, so that actually the Commonwealth does not lag behind. Now, just let me conclude by saying that some political actors are convinced that press freedom and safety of journalists is a coin that is really high value to society. And of course, we know many leaders still have to be convinced of this. And then in between, we know that many pay lip service to press freedom, which of course, lip service is not enough. But you don't have to go far to imagine the opposite. In fact, uh, Julie, you mentioned it. When you have leaders calling the press a public enemy, it means that you can't even challenge them for hypocrisy or double speak because they basically are treating the, the press as a public enemy. When they say something and do something else, at least you can try and reduce the, the distance between word and deed. So in this context, I think the people in this discussion, civil society, uh, the Commonwealth, there's really an important role to strengthen these norms of press freedom because then the duty bearers, in other words, the governments can be held to be accountable for actual adherence to these norms which are so important, especially in this COVID epoch that we are in. Thanks very much, Guy. You've taken us um, exactly into the territory that I wanted to head next, which is around uh, movement uh, within the Commonwealth um, connected to the Commonwealth principles uh, on freedom of expression. And we have a question from uh, William Horsley, uh, who's a member of the Executive Committee of the Commonwealth Journalists Association, uh, also affiliated um, with my colleagues at the University of Sheffield Centre for Freedom of the Media. And William asks a really important question. Uh, he says that three years ago, the Commonwealth Journalists Association and five other Commonwealth organisations drew up these principles that I mentioned uh, on the role of media in good governance as a constructive basis uh, to make good its charter pledges to uh, protect a vibrant, free and responsible media, uh, he points out that the initiative was praised by the Commonwealth uh, Secretary General and uh, international human rights lawyers like Amal Clooney. But he says very recently, this joint effort to achieve a breakthrough uh, on the pressing issues through dialogue um, uh, and, and to set up um, protocols for the adoption, the formal adoption uh, and embedding of these principles uh, halted. Um, so there is a stalemate um, and he asks, is it right that one group of Commonwealth states can stop such a significant initiative without being held to account? How otherwise can civil society and willing states create an effective framework for the Commonwealth to fulfill its promises consistent with international standards on journalism, safety and media freedom? So what you can hear William echoing there is concern that's been expressed by a range of people involved in this community, and that is uh, that the objections of certain states within the Commonwealth um, have derailed a process to try to ensure that these principles uh, are formally um, not just adopted, but implemented and endorsed. Um, can I ask uh, any of you on the, the panel of eight, <laughs> uh, if you'd like to respond to that, if anybody in particular is involved in these processes, how do you try to ensure that intergovernmental organisations are actually able to hold states to account? Um, and what do you do when processes are derailed by those who would seek to subvert these sorts of movements? Raise your hand if you'd like to respond. <laughs> no, everybody is, is, uh, is ducking from this. So Guy, I'm gonna come back to you. Thank you for that. <laughs> 
I was coming back your way anyway. Um, I mean, you're very familiar with these uh, geopolitical uh, challenges, right? The realities of dealing uh, with uh, a range of different member state perspectives, if you like. Um, how do you respond to that uh, challenge put by William Horsley? Yes, I think William uh, put his finger on the, um, hit the nail on the head or put his finger on the button there because it is a question of what moves history and uh, well we know that companies uh, shape history we know that governments can shape history but civil society also shapes history and it's civil society that really makes a big difference to these international discussions and to the position that states take because states will know that civil society is is monitoring them and uh, will hold them to account and the credibility of these international organizations means that uh, in a way uh, they they need to live up to what they have uh, signed up to at the beginning the basic principles which are generally in favor of freedom of expression and so it's not necessarily pushing uphill it's more pushing you know with the grain so that you can get these uh, states particularly those that are in the middle to decide that they're going to try and get a majority over, over overwhelming consensus in terms of more positive uh, norms. And that is a matter of persuading them. And it's a matter of civil society back home working with them. And it's a matter of the secretariat in these organizations also playing its role to remind states about their commitments. Because in the end, uh, these international organizations can really make a positive role. I gave the example of the Commonwealth in, in, in relation to apartheid South Africa. Uh, I could speak about uh, United Nations and the World Press Freedom Day that, that, I, that I mentioned and so on. These things can happen. We should not be fatalistic. It's, it's really combining forces and coming down to these duty bearers in these organizations and trying to get them to make that, that, that commitment and then to follow up on that commitment. So a combination of diplomacy and activism. But Shahidul, you also uh, had raised your hand there. I'm interested um, from, a, from a journalist's perspective. Um, you know, I often hear, uh, I am a journalist as well as an academic and I've shared what I'm about to describe as uh, hearing frustration from journalists about the failure um, to name and shame within UN organizations, for example, or other intergovernmental organizations. What do you think from the perspective of somebody who's really, you know, born, born a, a serious price uh, in Bangladesh is the role of other Commonwealth nations, uh, particularly those who are considered to be, for example, more progressive, um, you know, Western liberal democracies. What do you think uh, they should be doing when um, member states of the Commonwealth behave in such a way? Well, firstly, I very rarely find governments that do not promote freedom and democracy in their rhetoric and actively oppose it in their practice. I think that's the way it works. Uh, and generally, uh, regimes which have been very vocal about press freedom while in opposition turn complete turtle when they're in power and use the very tools of oppression that have been used in the past. Uh, uh, I'm not someone who is in a position um, to influence the international groups, but within our country, I think it is possible to hold to account the donor community, the NGOs, um, uh, the larger powers, and question them on their own position. Because one of my concerns is that they too um, do go along with the rhetoric and are pussyfooting and putting up with repression in many situations. There is no way my government could get away with the things they get away with had there not been, if not tacit support, at least uh, looking the other way uh, by the major entities. And I, I think those hard questions need to be asked. Mm -hmm. But strategically, as journalists, I think we also while we do what we do in terms of reporting, I think it's also important for us to be on that head table because at the end of the day, you need to be heard and we need to be strategic and ensure that our, our own voice is amplified sufficiently um, and that we uh, are in a position of influence uh, and can make this difference. There, I think the fact that the media itself 
has often lost its way and not played its own role is problematic. And our own credibility is at stake. So initially, we need to establish our own credibility and then to challenge the credibility of others. And we don't really have time to get into this in this discussion, but there is, of course, a historic problem, uh, particularly in Western models of journalism, where there is a reluctance to do media freedom activism, to defend journalism safety. Uh, whether you're an editor or a journalist, you know, it's perceived um, still in some quarters to be inappropriate to take a stand on these issues. Um, but he, here in the UK, for example, even the, the venerable uh, and um, unbiased, uh, according to its mantra, BBC uh, no longer um, held, holds a view that these things are forbidden. In fact, um, media freedom uh, and journalism safety are actively promoted. So I think that's a really um, important point to, to echo, uh, Shahidul. And uh, Stefan, are you trying to also, yes, your hand is raised, sorry. So hard yes. with thumbnails. <laughs> I wish we were all in a physical room. <laughs> so yes, you, what would you, you like start, to add? You started on the point that I, that, that, that I wanted to, to add that um, it's, in, in, it's important for us to understand that beyond just the mere reporting of the seven day wonders, there, need to be, there needs to be greater big picture and deeper mm -hmm. levels of, of, of journalism, investigative journalism, so that these things aren't missed um, on the day-to-day -day basis, that we constantly remind the citizens and the people that, that all of these things might sound abstract, but they have real life, everyday, real world impacts on our practice and by extension, your, your, your rights and your freedoms. Mm -hmm. so, so, so it might not be the typical um, stories that, that come across, particularly in the, in the Caribbean, you know, the politics, the crime, the violence but understanding that the bigger policies, the, the, these, these, these agreements do have an impact on you, on your life as the, the everyday mm. citizen. I would absolutely agree with that, that explanatory journalism about uh, the media freedom rights and the benefit to broader society uh, are really important. Um, and in fact, friend and, and uh, academic colleague, uh, Dr. Julie Reed from South Africa has theorized about media freedom being uh, a combination of both journalists' rights and citizens' rights to access uh, accurate, uh, fair and reliable information and to participate in the co-production of it. And I think that's a, a very useful way to, to think about this too. Um, we have another question, uh, in fact, from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, from Kanba Hossein Boer, uh, who coordinates um, the Media Freedom uh, Campaign. Um, and his question is, uh, to highlight the work of the 43 countries that are signed up to that campaign, including apparently eight Commonwealth countries uh, working together to try and promote this. Um, I'm going to come to, to you, Claire, on this one, since you raised it before. Uh, the UK with Canada um, has been uh, certainly working hard to promote these themes, um, but you indicated earlier, Claire, uh, that more needed to be done. And we have a question here from uh, the Foreign and, and Commonwealth Office, um, which is, does the panel have any thoughts on the scope of the Commonwealth to work with the coalition to promote media freedom? What is it that you wanted to say about the role of the UK, Claire? Well, um, I think there are perhaps three areas in which um, I felt that um, we fell short um, as a sort of leading promoter of, of media freedom and, and, a, and a sort of advanced democracy. Um, certainly, you know, in my experience with, with the 1MDB uh, situation. Um, Which is a Malaysian that, uh, issue uh, around. Uh, yes, a, a, Malay, a, a major um, a criminal uh, investigation um, involving the theft of a great deal of money uh, mm. from the public of Malaysia by its prime minister. Um, and um, when I um, started to, to investigate that, I, several, several areas, I mean, Britain needs to look more closely at uh, its facilitating role. Um, a huge blind eye continues to be turned to the impact of our whole offshore system, which enables so much of um, the corruption to take place. We also have a major industry in terms of um, uh, protection of uh, global criminals, uh, from law firms to uh, banks that have been turning a blind eye. I mean, there was a, a massive 
um, number of banks were involved in somehow managing to move this money and not notice that it was um, illegal cash. Um, and, you know, we have this whole professional panoply of uh, PR people, um, very big PR firms were involved in vilifying me, um, as they have been um, in vilifying other journalists, um, massive expensive operations, um, and, and corporate investigators, you know, we have a great professional class that are pretty much operating on, you know, un, unbothered by um, Brit regulators in Britain, and we need to look harder at the activities of PR companies, law firms and others who are enabling um, offshore criminals. Um, the, the other disappointment for me was when I brought evidence of British companies that were involved in 1MDB uh, to our fraud authorities in Britain, uh, there was a zero response. Um, I did have one interview with some senior people, but it became quite clear that Britain was not going to get involved in what they described as a too expensive um, investigation. We had to rely on the good offices of the United States uh, to intervene um, in 1MDB but there was a great deal that Britain could have done sooner um, if it had been um, a fellow, uh, you know, active Commonwealth member, they could have, you know, we, and we need to pull together. Um, and finally, um, Britain has a libel system, a, a law system that is very, very um, oppressive to journalists. And, and you know, they've kindly, um, you know, distributed, uh, you know, that uh, model um, throughout the Commonwealth. So there are very oppressive libel laws that are obviously um, hugely abused in more oppressive countries, um, even beyond how they're um, exploited in Britain. Um, now I see in a pla places like Malaysia, um, you know, you'll see the government availing itself of libel laws against critics. Um, in Britain, it's the super wealthy who are able to avail themselves. Um, and the result of that is that mainstream media uh, particularly in these times, and, and, and talking to journalists all over the world, this is something we haven't touched on, so I just very briefly touch on it. Um, it's the financial system as much as anything else that is crippling um, good investigative journalism. Uh, mainstream media, they're, they're, these are businesses, and to stay afloat, they're avoiding, they're avoiding doing investigative work because of the uh, crippling costs of libel actions. Um, and, and, and we need to address that. Governments need to address that to make it less profitable and less disastrous for newsrooms uh, facing uh, libel action, um, so-called slap suits. Um, we need to really work out a way of, um, because again, it's, it, 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 it falls to the independent journalists, people like me and other individuals mm -hmm. who are passionate about what they're, they're working on to cover stories uh, like 1MDB, that mainstream media just say, oh, that's too expensive, there are too many wealthy people who will cost us too much money to cover this story. That, that really isn't good enough for the public for the public benefit. A number of important points made there clear, and um, one of them is the need for um, Commonwealth member states and, and you know, a country like uh, the United Kingdom um, to lead by example. I mean, we've had this discussion in the US context uh, where, you know, there were there was a real reluctance um, by uh, states with a long tradition of democratic support for freedom of expression rights, Western liberal democracies, very reluctant to critique uh, President Donald Trump um, when he attacked the media, but at the same time, quite willing to attack uh, and uh, critique uh, Rodrigo Duterte um, and Bolsonaro in Brazil. Um, so, you know, there's, I think this is important uh, food for thought. Um, Caroline, can I come to you? Because this is uh, relevant. I mean, you mentioned before Malta being, you know, an EU country um, and the, the awful case of Daphne Caruana Galizia being murdered with impunity, essentially, although there are legal investigations ongoing. Um, where we saw the sorts of practices that have been associated historically um, with more despotic states or with weaker democracies, um, you know, now coming uh, to Europe. So what do you think um, those organizations taking, uh, or, or countries taking a leadership position, um, including say the UK and Canada and those, those nations involved in the Media Freedom Coalition need to do to set an appropriate example um, for countries to follow. I mean, we have uh, Amal Clooney, who, who I mentioned before, who was previously uh, closely connected um, with that Media Freedom Coalition, saying that there need to be sanctions 
for states that oppose media freedom, for example? What, what's your view on that? First of all, I'd like to really stress um, what um, the point that Claire mentioned on SLAP, because, because this is really, really hitting uh, investigative journalism, not only in Malta, but all in Europe, but around the world. We had, we've, in our three years of operation, we've, we've faced at least five or six major slap lawsuits that we've had to fight. Um, these are these are lawsuits that are intended to. I mean, you can't fight. They, they just mounting just mounting a defence is is something you can't afford. So the only the only avenue that you have is to scream and shout and and tell the world that this is happening. So 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 governments need to rain down on this. We we today work in in a global environment. And then, and then you have you know legislation that is national, but then can be applied internationally, and it, it's 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 just a it's just a whole it's a whole mess, and we're somewhere in between, um, realistically, in terms of what um, governments can do. I mean, when it comes to the Commonwealth, it, it, it's a free association of, of of sovereign states. The principles, in essence, are agreed upon. What we need is effective implementation. What we need is substantive mm. backing by governments, parliaments, civil society, NGOs to turn these principles into reality. And, and there are voices on the ground, there are journalists doing, there's civil society doing, and all of this. So um, it's not due to a lack of action um, on the ground, it, it, it's, it's more due to a lack of backing, of support. Of, of, of realistic implementation of the principles we all claim to uphold. Okay, thanks, Caroline. Some people seem to be having trouble uh, hearing you, although I'm hearing you quite clearly. So if you do speak again, just as close as the mic to the microphone as you can get, please. Same goes for you, Zoe. I'm going to come to you in a moment. Um, but uh, Manase Azure, you, you raised your hand there. What would you like to say? And this is your final chance to, to make a point because we're coming close to the end of our session. Well, I would say with, uh... Commonwealth, uh, the developed countries, has uh, or should begin to include media freedom as one of the major issues for which they would consider sanctions against certain individuals or governments, because there are certain countries that don't uh, have any accountability mechanisms to hold the governing class to account for anything they do. So sometimes the only way out is to let that power or control come from outside. And I'm saying this because when you look at media freedom, 2016, I decided to look at the press freedom index and the corruption perception index. And I realized that the top ranked countries, the first 20 in both sides, they had an intersection of 16 of them ranking up. up. So if you look at corrup uh, sorry, corruption perception index and then the media freedom index, I think these are all elements of good governance. And so it should be very keen. I want to end by saying that we should not allow the fight to be that of journalists, because in this country, it is increasingly becoming difficult to get someone to sign up to become an investigative journalist. These days, I drive around town with armed police escort. It is not something that you feel comfortable and you can't be walking around with armed police escort and try to encourage others to come and then do this kind of work. So I think the international community, especially Commonwealth, should pay more attention to it. And I agree perfectly with some of the things my colleagues said. Sometimes just looking away is an encouragement to the impunity that some government officials visit on journalists in the mostly uh, developing world. I have a question uh, from the audience about the, the connection between the development of press freedoms and uh, the work of civil society organisations. And we've talked a bit about um, the ways in which civil society can assist, but I'm interested also in potential collaborations between civil society and uh, and journalism and, and how these sorts of collaborations uh, could perhaps progress things. Zoe, um, would you like to respond to that? What, what do you think can be done collaboratively between journalism and civil society, for example, to uh, advance media freedom? Um, Julie, can you hear me? I can, I hope everybody else can too. Okay, just checking. Um, I think we have, um, 
experienced some really good examples of where civil society um, and journalists have worked very well together um, in our context specifically around promoting um, what I've referred to earlier as this legal framework that guarantees the right to access to information. So um, whilst it may be a contentious issue in, 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 in certain um, say jurisdictions, Namibian journalists, for example, um, are very clear about the activist role that they assume when um, it comes to issues that really affect them, um, the profession. Um, so that's just one um, example. Um, we have, uh, to give you another example, um, in about five years ago, uh, when we celebrated the 25th anniversary of uh, the Vintuk Declaration, um, one of the things that civil society did was to uh, try to develop a lot of media content um, that would make that clear link between um, freedom of expression, press freedom, and the lived experience of citizens. Mm -hmm. And once you provide journalists um, and broader society with that information, that um, collaboration becomes um, much easier to, to uh, propose. One just, of the things that- I'm just gonna have to uh, get, get you to leave it there, Zoe. We're effectively out of time. And I just wanna give Guy um, a chance. Um, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds on the clock, Guy. If you can perhaps leave us uh, with a final thought before I wrap up about, uh, based on all of the experience you've outlined, perhaps one concrete step that could be taken um, by those invested in these issues and trying to progress um, media freedom uh, for the Commonwealth. Thank you, Julie. So very concretely, on the 3rd of May will be World Press Freedom Day with Namibia as the host. It will probably be uh, at least a hybrid conference with lot virtual, and there could well be the launch of an international task force of international organizations about the safety of journalists. And the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth Foundation are invited <laughs> to come and observe and even to join this uh, task force to take this forward. Okay, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. And we are out of time. I've been given grace by the organisers to go for another minute or two to wrap things up. Thank you very much for all of you. The chat has been incredibly uh, active and for all of your questions, uh, sincere thanks. Um, I'm told that there will be other events pursuing some of the themes that have been discussed today, um, along with a series of, of blog posts that the Commonwealth Foundation will curate to try to get to um, the crux of some of these issues and perhaps to pull together um, some recommendations based on some of the uh, really valuable insights, both a combination of, of lived experience um, from journalists really at the front line of uh, these struggles, uh, but also those with expertise in trying to move the needle on uh, freedom of expression rights and access to information rights, um, and also the, the critical questions connected to journalism safety. And all of this, of course, is bound up with development uh, within the Commonwealth. You cannot have uh, media development without integrating media freedom principles, and you cannot have media freedom without um, capable uh, and viable uh, news organizations, or at least um, individual journalists and independent journalists who are able to hold power to account, hopefully in ways that are increasing, increasingly collaborative. Um, we've heard today a lot about um, the problematic role of social media uh, and the polluted information ecosystem. That is still an enormous challenge, but we need to bear in mind, of course, that many countries, including uh, a number in the Commonwealth, do not have uh, decent access to the internet, which can, of course, also be uh, an important empowering vehicle for the rights that we're seeking to preserve and protect. Um, and please just join me in celebrating the bravery and commitment and capability professionalism uh, of the five journalists who joined us first, um, because without them, we would all be poorer uh, because we wouldn't have such access to critical uh, accountability journalism. So I really do thank you, um, the five of you, for, for, for joining us today, spending so much time with us and trying to, to steer us through this. Um, power to you. Be safe, everybody, and um, I hope to see you again soon, preferably in person. Bye-bye. <laughs>